So I'm going to talk mostly about residential ventilation. So most of you are going to go, ah, yeah, who cares? Um, why we might care is because traditionally we didn't ventilate homes at all in any sort of mechanical sense. Whereas we ventilated large buildings like this, and most of you are probably familiar with that. But we have started to ventilate homes. And it turns out that the new thing is ventilation. Not that there are new things about ventilation, but putting all that aside, I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about later in terms of advancing technologies and so on are things that are being thought about for homes, but they're going to come to commercial institutional buildings also. It's kind of just a matter of time to see where we go. So the, the first thing is, I, I assume you, you all know this, right? Why do we want to ventilate? To get all the bad stuff out of the air. That's the theory, right? And there's stuff like, obviously, I mean, puppies are lovely, but they can be stinky, right? And, and traditionally, odors was the thing that all the ventilation standards that tell you what the airflow requirements are, they were all based on odors. And there are people with trained noses who sniffed things and were put in chambers and decided, this is how much airflow you need. Um, things like health, this is kind of a new idea, right? That there might be things in the air that have some health impacts. Uh, and moisture is something we just wave our hands about generally speaking, particularly in residential where we don't specifically do moisture control. Uh, maybe in larger buildings where you're specifically controlling humidity, that happens. In residences, you just get what you get. So the advances here have been in thinking beyond simply looking at odor control, because that's kind of a very rough thing. And odor is often, you know, maybe I like the smell of a cooked chicken when I'm about to have my dinner. I don't want to ventilate it away. These things are highly, highly subjective. But maybe health isn't. So what we've been uh, doing in recent years is looking to see what's actually in the air in buildings. This is specifically homes, but it, does, it doesn't change very much between buildings. And these are all the different things that we find in the air that might have a health impact. And we have this metric called disability adjusted life years, or DALIs. And basically that says you're either going to get sick and not feel too well, or your life will get shortened. We'll combine that into some number. I won't go into the details. Basically, if the DALIs are big, it's really bad for you. So the stuff that's bad, the thing that pops out right away, is right up here at the top, it's the particles in the air that have the biggest health impacts by far, by something like an order of magnitude. So if you care about health, use good filters. Seems pretty straightforward, right? But there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on, like mold and moisture, formaldehyde that's emitted from lots of building products and construction materials, um, oddities like acrolein from combustion, ozone, and so on. By the way, SHS here is secondhand smoke. If you're smoking, I can't help you. So I'm only half joking. When we talk about ventilation, we don't ventilate for what I would call acute or severe events. This is just general ventilation, assuming nothing crazy is happening in this room or in your home or in the building you're talking about. If you're doing crazy stuff, you need to be more careful. For example, in this building next door here, they do a lot of chemistry, a lot of things in the air you don't want. So they have fume hoods that are specifically designed to deal with those acute things. That's not what general building and household ventilation is about at all. The other thing that's happening is we're making our homes and buildings in general tighter and tighter, mostly for good reasons. It's so that they're more comfortable, so you don't have drafts, and so that we can save a bit of energy because all that air going in and out needs to get conditioned somehow. And this is just showing you some measured data from, from these are California results, but they're pretty much true nationwide across the whole country. Homes are getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And this metric we use is air change is now at 50 pascals. Has anybody in the room ever heard of this thing? A few of you. For the rest of you, that number is telling you how leaky the exterior envelope is. And we get it by putting a fan in a doorway and blowing air in and out of the building and measuring the pressures across the building envelope. And air changes at 50 is how many times the air in the building gets changed if you have 50 pascals across the building envelope. And again, bigger number means leakier. So uh, in old homes, we're up here. My house is about up here, too, but we'll get back to that. Um, most new homes nationwide in California are at about four. The IECC has a requirement of about three for energy efficient new construction for most of the country. There's a few places where you can have five, but three is. And so we're getting there. And if you're looking at you know, net zero homes like we're trying to build in California or very energy efficient buildings, we're going to be down here. That's a big change. And when we change the air leakage, we change the air flows a lot. So there's a huge concern about air quality. To mitigate that, we have some standards. ASHRAE 62.1 is about commercial buildings, which I won't talk about because I'm massively biased towards this standard as I chair it. This is the National Ventilation Standard for Homes, ASHRAE 62.2. And what does it do? Um, 
It tells you how to ventilate your home. It includes things like kitchen, bathrooms, exhaust, all that sort of stuff. And we've added some new stuff recently. And these are things that might be coming to all buildings, not just residential. Things like if you do really good filtration, because filtering out particles is a great idea for improving health, we're going to give you some sort of a credit. Um, if you get smarter about your ventilation controls, which I'll talk about a bit in a few minutes, um, we're going to give you a, a pathway to comply for that. And there's things like retrofitting buildings. It's often much, much harder to install ventilation systems in an existing building. There's no, it's hard to find places to put the ducts. You might not even have wires run into the rooms that need an extraction fan. There's all sorts of barriers. And we have you know, ways to deal with that. But I want to emphasize, whenever you look at this standard for homes, or ASHRAE 62.1 for all the other buildings and spaces, these are minimums. It's just the worst. And I emphasize this because people get confused all the time. People think that this is best practice. This is the opposite of best practice. It's legally the worst thing you can do without getting sued. That's not best practice. So anything, you can do better, but this just says, what's the minimum? You're, you're laughing, but this happens all the time. So, so we have standards. And if everybody complied and everything got installed perfectly, and we would, we would be great, right? You, you all know where this is going. Um, here at LBL and other researchers, all not just as in the US, but everywhere, um, we've gone out and commissioned these systems. And what do we find? That failure is endemic. And the problem is, as we go to tighter and tighter buildings, that has a bigger and bigger problem. At my leaky old house, if my exhaust fan fails, well, things will get a little bit worse, but it won't get terrible. If you're in a brand new, very tight building, not having ventilation is a crisis for you. So it's important. There's no natural infiltration backup. This is typically what we see for air inlets for HRVs. They're completely plugged up. Or when they got installed, nobody put the sheet metal screws in, and so the duct just fell off. Or they weren't connected properly. Faults are incredibly common. Um, in residential, we sort of split things between exhaust fans, supply fans, what we call balance systems. Balance systems often have heat recovery or energy recovery in them. You're probably familiar with that sort of thing. And it turns out some systems uh, are easier to install. That's why they work better when we go to commission them. Supply systems are chronically hard to install in residential applications. Very, very difficult. And you know, how are you going to measure the inlet to the supply. In a large HVAC system in a big building, it might even have built-in flow sensor grids, right? So you'll know the airflow. Does your house have that? No. Is it ever going to have it? Probably not. But we can argue about that with the ventilation equipment manufacturers. So we end up doing things like putting seven painter poles together, trying to find the inlet duct underneath the eave of a house. This doesn't work, by the way, in case you're interested. Uh, so our, our industry, by our, I mean the residential industry, has some problems that we need to solve here. The other thing is that uh, labeling makes a big difference because even if all these things get installed right, if they're turned off, they don't work. We recently did a survey of 70 brand new homes in California. Fully a quarter of them had the system operating. The other three quarters, it was turned off. Uh, we have research partners doing this um, now for a, a DOE study nationwide. That's pretty much the national average is three quarters of ventilation equipment is turned off. It's no different from your, for your large buildings either. So don't think you're getting away with it just because you work on large buildings and not residences. We've tested them too. You go on a rooftop, often the fans are not turning. The belts are missing that link motors to fans. The motors are frozen up. Somebody turned it off for maintenance three years ago and then forgot to turn it on again. Or they never, ever changed the filters. And there's no airflow. This is, this is a, a chronic, chronic problem. So we found out that in homes, at least, if you put a good label on, you know, you know, this isn't great. You get just over half the systems are turned on. But it's way better if there's no label. So labeling stuff is important if you're going to allow people in a space to change stuff. And this is not just, doesn't just apply to ventilation. It applies to all sorts of control strategies and so on. If you allow the occupants to control stuff, you better have some good labels. So there's some alternatives to this. I mean, uh, who knows about ASHRAE? Probably most of you. Yes, no, maybe so? OK. It has guidelines about labeling switches. This is a lot of words that no one will ever read if you try to put it on a switch. But you know they're trying. Uh, my buddy Paul Raymer says, just go to the, put every control at a breaker and label the breaker as television and ventilation. Never get turned off. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a joke, but, but it, it's important because we have to understand how people work. People, normal people, 
not, not engineers and ventilation geeks, they're not going to read that and figure it out. And our, our industry, our ventilation industry, we need to understand how people work if we want them to do what we want them to do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about multifamily buildings, because we've only just really started to figure out uh, single family homes. And now our heads are falling off because we're trying to deal with multifamily. There's, there's a whole host of issues, things like compartmentalization, this idea that each unit is independent from another, far from true. So we're looking at, you know, in terms of new stuff, adding leakage limits to these things and actually testing buildings. Who knows? Maybe that'll be a thing. Um, there's some great, some great technologies that have been developed from... Uh, here at LBL, we developed a system of duct sealing using aerosol particles that we might use to seal all the little cracks in a building envelope. Now, you don't want to do that in an occupied home, but, uh, or an occupied building, but in new construction, it turns out it works pretty well. Um, there's all sorts of issues about where do you put the inlets and outlets. Uh, if you're looking at most multifamily buildings, they don't have much wall area. And we try and do things like have the our air inlets far away from the outlets. Like if you're cooking and you turn on the range hood and you vent it to outside, you don't want to be sucking your supplier in right next to it or next to a dryer vent or anything like that. So there's a whole bunch of issues that um, are new in terms of we're trying to figure out what's going on uh, and are also new in terms of we don't actually have a great answer to that. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the thing is a lot of multifamily units still have a gas furnace or a gas water heater of their very own in each unit. So this doesn't get centralized into one giant system. And when we get into these problems of if you don't compartmentalize, you have massive air flows inside the building, mostly driven by, is it windy today or is it cold outside? And they can do things like do lots of bad things about draft for these combustion appliances. Then you fill the home with all the um, products of combustion, and nobody likes that. It's bad for your health. You get condensation on the windows. Not a good situation. And frankly, nobody's dealing with that. So. I, I'm painting a bleak picture, right? So now we're going to turn the page and say, so what, what are the smarter things we're trying to do to try and deal with some of these issues? Uh, smart ventilation is sort of a, a generic term for this idea that um, the one good thing about ventilation, if we're not ventilating for acute events, because we're thinking about long-term exposures to contaminants or long-term effects of moisture buildup in a building, is that when things are long-term, we can move when we vent ventilate around in time. So if I'm looking at the, your cumulative exposure to some contaminant in, in the air, and I, I'm really only interested in something, say, over a, a year. So we've, if we ventilate less for a, for a little bit of time, we're exposed to higher concentrations. But ventilate more at another time, so you're exposed to lower, that total for the year is about the same. And that's what we're doing with smart ventilation, is we're moving when ventilation happens around in time. And that has some good advantages for if we want to save energy. So that means that we could ventilate less when it's very cold or very hot outside, ventilate more when it's milder. You would be exposed as the occupant to the same amount of, um, you'd have the same exposure, but we can significantly change the energy impact of ventilating the building. So that, 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 that's one key thing. The other thing is that if we're just looking at say, whole dwelling ventilation, if you count the exhaust fans in the kitchens and the bathroom, they're almost always moving way more air than what you need to just do general ventilation. If we count those as ventilation, we can turn off the general ventilation system while they're operating. And again, this has a bunch of energy benefits without resulting in harmful concentrations inside over long periods of time. The other thing is that we used to just talk about energy and I think we've moved beyond that in the buildings and energy world. I mean, all, all the people in Building 90, all my colleagues here at LBL, we're also thinking about peak electricity, maybe peak gas one day, but that's unlikely. But this idea that uh, the cost of energy varies with time also. Most of you here are probably familiar with time of use rates here in California and the idea that um, our, our building energy code, Tile 24, has something called TDV which is the time, it includes the time value of energy. In other words, the cost of a kilowatt hour changes depending on which hour of the year it is. If you can ventilate smart and not ventilate when that cost is high and ventilate more when it isn't, um, not only is that a financial incentive, but also if you're a utility program, you love it. Because that means that if we talk about houses, you could maybe reduce that um, air conditioning load by, say, 500 watts 
for a couple of hours because you're not ventilating on peak. And if all the houses in a development do it, it can add up to some big numbers. So in other words, you can have a home that's more responsive to the grid. The caution is a lot of people, a lot of uh, manufacturers decided that smart ventilation sounds great. So they're going to put that label on everything. All the labels you see for smart ventilation don't do any of those good things I just told you. <laughs> the, the key thing they do is they will often be responsive to outdoor conditions. They will do things like, if it's very cold outside, turn off the ventilation. What they don't do is make up for that later. So well, that is a trade-off of you save energy, but the air quality is worse. And you can always turn stuff off to save energy. Right? It doesn't get you anywhere. You can always not heat a building. It won't be comfortable but you'll save the energy. You could turn all the lights off, but it'll be dark at night, but it doesn't help you. That, that, that's, 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 that's no way to go. So we're working on getting some definitions together and get people to agree to it. So I wanted to give you a quick example of, if we, we did a bunch of uh, simulations to look at how much energy could you save with these sort of smart ventilation strategies. This is a map of um, the US. For those of you who are not good at geography, we're over here. <laughs> and these are the sort of, <laughs> Ventilation energy savings, we're talking about, it depends a lot on climate, as you can imagine, right? Um, but, you know, typically, we're easily able to save half the energy. So this is getting close to the performance of a heat recovery ventilator. But it's something like, a, a, you know, a 20th to a, a tenth of the cost. It's a very cheap way to get this. Easy to retrofit. And we'll, we'll be doing more of it. There's a couple of uh, sort of interesting technologies that I just want to touch on quickly that are not just controls related, which is what the smart ventilation is, it's about controlling a ventilation system. It's about um, some ideas about how can we retrofit buildings. We're getting very interested in, uh, new construction is trivial, right? In California, we've already decided all new homes are net zero, piece of cake. But what do we do about all the homes already built, right? So ideas about these through the wall ventilators that are very easy to install, um, and they work just like an HRV, except you don't have two fans, you only have one, and they exhaust for a while, and they supply for a while, and they have a little ceramic heat exchanger in there to give you some heat recovery. So if you're looking at some multifamily, this is, this is a sort of interesting idea. They have high claim efficiency. We haven't done any independent verification of that, but it looks like an interesting technology. There are, uh, there's currently a Building America study uh, uh, being done by DOE looking at integrated heat pump heat recovery ventilation. So it's getting a bit more complex, more like you might have in a non-residential system. And trying to figure out if that and things like heat pump exhaust heat recovery might work for probably not for single family, but for multifamily where you can stack units up and have a big unit on the roof. They might be technologies that are going to work. Like I say, these are new things currently under evaluation, so I can't tell you if they're excellent the way to go or not, but maybe in a couple of years we'll figure that out and there might be sort of some new and interesting products for us to think about. So that's sort of general ventilation. I want to talk about some specifics. Um, an area of research I've been working on for quite a while is cooking. Because cooking makes pollutants and it makes a lot of the pollutants we worry about. In your home, um, I talked about particles as being the, the biggest problem. A lot of them come from outside. They're almost always lower indoors than outdoors for a bunch of reasons. One thing is that the building envelope itself actually is a filter. And a typical new California home is like a, between something like a MERV 10 to MERV 12 filter. For those of you familiar with the MERV ratings on filters, it's pretty good actually. So you get lowers indoors until you cook. And cooking releases lots of particles. If you're burning natural gas, you are really, really cramming your house full of particles. Um, this is probably the single biggest health hazard in, in any home, is the uh, natural gas cooktop. Uh, electric's a bit better, but because we don't get all the water vapor and CO2, uh, but we still get ultrafine particles from something, anything that glows hot like this is going to make ultrafine particles. Um, the exception is induction cooktops, because they don't get hot, and so they don't make ultrafine particles. So if you're looking for a healthy way to cook at home, because I'm not saying you shouldn't cook, right? Uh, use an induction cooktop. Uh, and in Europe, uh, there a lot of a lot of places basically going exclusively to induction. They've had a big revolution there in the appliances they install in kitchens. Uh, we haven't had it here yet, but we might. Um, so there there are other things to do other than because just the cooking itself makes a lot of contaminants as well. There's various chemicals, you know, odors, obviously, water vapor particles and so on get produced. So we want to get rid of them. Um, so we, who has a range hood in their house? I'm hoping some of you do, at least. Who knows for sure 
that when you turn it on, it blows outside. All right. Who, does anybody have one of those devices we call forehead greases that returns it to you? <laughs> okay. Um, as you might imagine, um, if it returns it to you, it does, uh, you might as well not turn it on. It doesn't do anything. But range of performance varies a lot. So these are some, these are some measured performance. We'll, we have a thing called capture efficiency, which is if I'm emitting something from the cooktop and it goes up off the cooktop, how much of it gets captured and thrown away compared to how much comes in the kitchen for me to breathe, for my kids to breathe, and so on. So 100% so, so capture efficiency is the perfect range. Of it. Everything goes outside. So these are just some test results. You can see that capture efficiency ranges from about 40% to 100% for back burners, gets as low as 20% for front burners. So cook on the back burners. You know, here's some free advice that no matter what range hood you've got, it'll help you. Um, as flow goes up, as you imagine, capture gets better, but there's a lot of variability here. I mean, really, so what we've been working on is standardizing this. Uh, we developed an ASTM test procedure that's about to be adopted by the Home Ventilating Institute, uh, possibly AHAM, although AHAM are working on their own thing too, to actually rate range hoods. So when you go buy one, there'll be a label on it that says this is a 80% capture efficiency range hood. Then you can pick and choose between 60, 80, 70%. Um, we've got most of the manufacturers on board to do that. But if you want to not wait till those come out and go home and evaluate your own kitchen, get a stall and stand so you're looking down above the hood. If it looks like this, that's good coverage, you're fine. Mostly it's going to look like that. Eh, it's kind of OK. If it looks like this, not helpful. OK. So there are some simple tests you can do in your home when you go home today to figure out, should I get myself a better range hood? Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of other things happening with kitchen cooking. Um, rain, range hoods, like the whole house ventilation, it only works if you turn it on. I guarantee you if it's turned off, it doesn't work. So we're working uh, with a couple of manufacturers on ideas about automation, which means that it will detect the heat from the cooking. Or maybe it'll detect the moisture, or maybe the particles. Turns out, not trivial, because temperatures in rooms between the winter and the summer in a kitchen vary about as much as the temperature of the air entering a range hood, unless you've got something on full blast, right? If you're just, say, you know, simmering a pot of stew or you're, or you're making some pasta sauce or something, the actual average temperature of the plume is not very high. And so it's quite tricky to do these things. So we've been working on control algorithms and so on to automate this. We tested one of these uh, in one of our test trailers uh, down the hill here. And, um, we're, I, it's, it's amazed me how well we could do it. I, th I thought we'd never get it to work properly. But it turns out, well, we can. Um, so that's coming soon also. You'll soon be able to buy these products. Um, and like I said, we work with folks like HVI and ASTM on capture efficiency ratings. Um, one of the last things I want to talk about is that this is sort of linked to this idea of automation. We could only automate because we got better, cheaper sensors. If you had to spend $50,000 on an advanced particle sensor in order for the automation to work, so you've got to have some markup on that, blah, blah, blah. So you end up selling it for $150,000. That's a very expensive hood, not viable. But what if I can get you the sensor in bulk at $10? Maybe we can do something then, right? And there's been a minor revolution, I would say, in the last five years in low-cost sensing. Um, whether it's for uh, VOCs or particles or so on, there's a whole bunch of sensors out there. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of products you can go buy now. These are consumer grade products. They're r roughly $150 to $200. Some of them have a pretty display on them. Some of them don't. Some of them are linked to the cloud, so you can log in on your phone or, or your laptop and see what's happening in real time and all that sort of thing. Some of them have controls for filtration systems and so on. But they're based on these little sensors here, things like this, that have come down a lot in price. Um, so this gives us a lot of opportunity, but also a lot of we have to be a little bit cautious, right? So the question is, you know, can you, can you really use that to control a ventilation system? Or does it just provide some guidance? So I'll talk a little bit about some of the testing we've been doing. Over the last few years, we've been doing a, taking a lot of these low-cost monitors and testing them both in people's homes and under very controlled test conditions in our laboratory where we have highly trained technicians who can cook a pizza the same time every time. 
who can cook you a breakfast the same time every, every time, over and over and over again. And we expose these sensors to particles and contaminants from all these typical household sources. So that's cooking, candles, burning incense, and all that sort of stuff. So this is mostly a focus on particles, because that's the key thing for health. I'll talk a little bit about other contaminants in a minute. So these low-cost particle sensors, do they work? It turns out that actually, most, uh, so quite a few of them are pretty much OK for guidance. Like if you've got a little monitor like this in your kitchen, they actually do pretty much respond to the events that we see when we use our $50,000 particle sensors. They're actually not too bad. Um, they usually, the good ones are within a factor of two of the right answer. Um, if you want to use them outside, it might be a factor of five because particle size distributions are different. But you know, they're not terrible. There is a caution, though. You can't detect ultrafine particles. And while we are pretty sure there are health impacts of ultrafine particles, we don't know it as well as for larger particles. So we have to have some caveats on this. But that's simply because they're using light scattering to detect the particles. And the technology is limited to a, the smallest particles you can detect, about 0.3 microns in <coughs> diameter. We'll never, with these low cost sensors, we'll never detect the ultrafine. I'm just wondering what you define ultrafine particles as PM. Was what, what, is, yeah. what do you define yeah. PM? How do you define to PM? Uh, anything below about 0.3 typically, only because that's the cutoff for the light sensing devices. But, but, but often we talk about below 0.1 micron for ultrafines. And the, uh, just, just for clarity, when I talk about small particles, the, the, the typical thing we talk about, because we have the most health data, is something called PM 2.5. And that's the particles less than 2.5 microns in diameter. Those are the ones that are critical for health, because they get all the way into your lungs. And um, they can often get into your bloodstream. And the ultrafines, they can, the, I, I'll alarm everybody by saying they will cross the blood-brain barrier. <laughs> so it is alarming. Now, the caveat is we're not sure what the health impacts of that are. We think they're not great, but we don't know. But for PM 2.5, we have lots and lots of health data, both correlations between high particle events that happen and the number of people that get hospitalized with respiratory complaints and cardiac complaints. Not only is there that correlation, we also physiologically know something about ingesting those chemicals and what they do to the chemical processes in your body. So that's very well known. Ultrafines less so. Um, we still have questions about not all events get detected because different events generate particles of a whole range of sizes, and they're not all the same. And so if the event that generates the particles has the same size distribution that was assumed for the calibration, they were great, if not. Mm, they don't. And the last thing is, if I'm relying on this to control the ventilation system, it has to work for 20 years, minimum. I don't want to be buying a new sensor every five years. Who, who has the, no, right? Who nobody wants to be working that long? And we don't really know how they work after 20 years. This, I'm not going to go through this list, but there's other things we could detect, like carbon monoxide. There are great flue gas monitors that probably some of you have used in combustion testing. We don't have a low-cost sensor for that. We have no low-cost sensor for formaldehyde, which is the second highest issue after particles. Um, this integrating samplers for some of these things and not others. So, but people are working on this. And we're, we aren't there yet, but it's definitely coming to, our, to the building industry. We're going to do a whole bunch more monitoring and actually controlling on these things. Um, and in homes, we're getting there, and we'll be there soon. And the, the last thing I want to talk about is something. So this was sort of down in the weeds, super duper technology, shiny things. Um, something that is maybe a, a few levels above that is this is all fine. But if, if we, uh-oh, it doesn't matter. This is, this is, I'm going to talk about the, something like if, if, if we have to get away from looking at individual technologies to how do we implement stuff and how do we get people to care? Like, if I've got this great technology in my house or in my, in my commercial building, how does that get reflected in its value in the market? Who knows, right? There's, there's been things like energy scores. Who's heard of the HERS index for, for energy scoring, right? Um, a few years ago, uh, Resnet came up, uh, th this is all done through Resnet, uh, worked with EPA on a water index. So you could get a score for a building that told it how much water it was going to use. Um, the, the various uh, lead 
um, designations that are used by architects also often include energy and water. And what I think we need if we're going to include health and air quality is the same sort of thing, some sort of indoor air quality index. And we're working right now on developing this, where you could go to a home or, or a building, maybe do a few diagnostic tests, but you know, try and not measure the contaminants exactly too much, because that's expensive and changes a lot with time, and a point measurement in time is not very useful. But try and get something that will actually, like an energy or a water index, will rate the, uh, the building. Because we've talked to the folks in the real estate industry, in the banking industry, and they're like, sure, anyone can say anything about a building, but we don't care. You need to have some third party thing that says this is reliably better or worse, something you can market, something that adds value, something that shows value, which has been pretty successful with the energy indices that, we, that we've used. And now we want to do that for air quality too. And so this is sort of moving away from a technology into a marketing and how do you value things. And this is more like changing the world, right? You, we can invent all the technologies we want. But if nobody else wants it, if there's no value to it, no, no building owner or homeowner is ever going to install it, right? And I'm going to stop there because that's my last slide. And I'll take, do I have time for one or two questions, Jenny? At the back there. Maybe I maybe I missed this, but why not just have the the range hood fan turn on when you turn on the range? Yeah, you, spoken like an engineer. That's I'm an engineer. That's what I would do. I'd okay. have an interlock. This is well. Didn't I have to like push a button or turn a button to turn on the burner? Yeah. Should, yeah, that's a great idea. I like it. Okay. <laughs> it's the difficulty is that um, by you know the technology is there. You could do it wirelessly if you wanted and so on. Yeah. But but. But you'd have to buy the equipment from the same person. And trying to get all the manufacturers of cooktops and range hoods to agree on some sort of communication protocol. If they all put the same little wireless transmitter in the cooktop, and they all put the same receiver in, we'd be golden. But you guys already know how this works, right, in the buildings industry. We can't get the manufacturers to agree on, a, on what protocol to use for that. So, but it, it would totally work, for sure. I just installed one that's Bluetooth to the range. Oh, oh excellent. Hardwired so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's good for you guys, but, but can, you know, can everybody do that? Can everybody hardwire their kitchen? I, I don't know. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you for your One attention. more question. I'll, I'll, one I'll last be, question, and around. that's People, it. I don't want to take up any more of, oh, of anyone else's One time. last question. Oh, okay. So I always wonder, I, I grew up at one point in time, I lived and I cooked with wood. And uh, uh -huh. so, and, and I'm alive today. And I always wonder what, certainly there's problems with PM10, there's problems with ACH50 because you don't know what portion of the air actually went in and out. You know, a lot of it just hung out and stayed there. It hasn't moved in, in a long time. And I just wonder how much in terms of the grand, grand the large picture of health, does this have to do with things? Okay. Uh, you're right. If, there were, if the health impacts were small, it wouldn't matter. But the health impacts are very large. So um, some of the people who are very interested in their air quality and things like retrofitting buildings to improve the air quality are people who run public health programs. Because the cost of, say, one hospital visit for someone who has asthmatic can retrofit 20 homes to have great filters in them. And wouldn't it be better just to have the great filters and have nobody go to the hospital? So a lot of what's driving this is coming from the healthcare industry, because believe you me, they track everything, like any good insurance company should, right? They know why people are coming in. They know about all the correlations with PM in particular. It's, it's a, lo a little less fuzzy. It's a lot more fuzzy, I should say, for other contaminants, but particles in particular. We, we know enough. There's been so many studies done that the data is very solid on this. And, and that's why the healthcare business is, is interested in these things, too. But I didn't have time to talk about that. We could talk after.